and that is novelty visualizations of collections data, real impact or comic interlude. This right. is presented by Nat Gustafson Sundell and Evan Roosh. Uh, Nat Gustaf Gustafson Sundell is a collections librarian. Evan Roosh is a reference librarian, and both of them work at Minnesota State University, Mankato. Uh, thank you for being here, and we will stop sharing our screen, and you can get started whenever you are ready. Okay, just give me a moment to share. Can you see my slides? Yes, looks good. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andres. Hello, my name's Nat. I've just gotten through COVID, so I apologize in advance if I'm a bit fuzzy or if I cough while presenting. Uh, we are librarians from Minnesota State University, Mankato, or MNSU, a regional public comprehensive university of about 14,000 students. We'd like to thank SUNY Law for this opportunity to present on this unusual topic. One other colleague, Mark McCullough, was going to join us for this presentation, but he's focusing on a different presentation. We want to thank Mark for his help as we talked through the issues involved in the development of novelty visualizations. His comments helped to inform many of our slides. Okay, so let's jump right into our presentation because we'd like to cover a lot of ground quickly. But first, let me provide a link to our slides. We know it can sometimes be difficult to follow along with a presentation or see all the little things on the slides. So you can download our deck at link.msu.edu forward slash novelty viz. At MNSU, we've developed collection analysis and data visualization products iteratively over many years. We've previously presented our data viz implemented with Tableau, Jupyter Notebook, and Microsoft Power BI at several conferences. The image on the screen is from a presentation we gave to NASIC in 2021. I'll provide a link at the end of this presentation in case you want to see some of that other work. We've thought a lot about charts and tables and how best to tell a story with data depending on the context. Today, we'll present an unusual approach to data viz. To be honest, we're not sure yet what to think of this new approach, thus the title of this presentation. Let me provide a brief background. It was the middle of the night and I woke up as I often do at about three in the morning. That's the time when ghosts visit, so I usually try to think of something to occupy my mind until I can fall asleep again. I had recently given some presentations on generative AI, and I was thinking about possible applications for DALI 3 and other image generators. I thought to myself, what if I was able to create illustrations of data, not as charts or tables, but as pictures, where the objects in the picture represent data? To be clear, I didn't want to create pictures only to serve as traditional infographics simply to illustrate the topic. I actually wanted the images to depict quantities accurately. And more, I wanted the pictures to depict two variable data relationships so that the proportions of objects in the picture would be quantitatively accurate as a comparison. <clears throat> so here's an example of a traditional two variable comparison I slapped together in Power BI for the purposes of this presentation. The columns represent the number of citable documents published in the last three years, while the line shows article downloads. The point here is just that this chart compares two variables, basically supply and demand. Of course, I thought it might also be interesting to create a one variable, I'm sorry, to create one variable illustrations, although I've seen these before. I think I first saw a chart like this in Time Magazine when I was about 10. Missiles were used in bar charts to compare the nuclear armaments of the USSR and the US. We'll provide some examples of one variable illustrations in this presentation. On the screen, you can see a creative example of one of these. The size of the mirror is meant to depict the supply of children's books for various populations. This picture is effective for getting its message across. But if read as a two variable chart, the size of the children would need to depict the sizes of the populations. Basically, my goal has been to create data illustrations that are accurate as charts. 
Today, I'll present a few examples of my work on these data illustrations, which we're calling novelty visualizations, or novelty viz. Evan Rush led our internal discussion about how these novelty viz might be used. used. He'll provide an overview of the issues we've discussed so far. Before I demonstrate any examples, I should be perfectly clear, we don't think we've been fully successful yet. The basic idea is to provide novelty visualizations that could lighten the mood of meetings with faculty or administration, or to provide a memorable insight. We would rely on our usual charts and tables for such presentations, but if we add one or two novelty viz, we might be able to create a better or a deeper impression. Unfortunately, though, Dolly 3 has problems and it might not be ready for what we're trying to do. You might see bizarre stuff in some images. And Dolly 3 isn't good with numbers yet. I didn't know Dolly wasn't good with numbers until I tried my first experiment. When I first asked Dolly 3 to depict two variable relationships, it tried, but it couldn't do it. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to Dolly 5 or 6 when these problems are resolved, which is to say that I think Dali will get better at what we're, at what we're trying to do now. For Dali 3, I needed to dramatically simplify what I was asking. Even with these problems, though, I was able to make a sort of successful comparison after about 15 minutes of trying. So then, let's imagine we're in a meeting. <laughs> In this imaginary meeting, I'm presenting on the value provided by our Springer journal package. So there I am, blah, 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 blah. I get to the slide where I show the usage provided by all of our most expensive journal packages. Springer usage is depicted by the yellow line. I ask, is Springer lost in the crowd? I follow this with a novelty visualization depicting the overall cost and usage of the Springer package relative to Elsevier. The size of the giant equates to the cost while the club size equates to usage. Overall, the image shows usage relative to cost. Please remember this illustration was my very first try and does not quite accomplish what I originally envisioned. This illustration was meant to prove the concept of novelty visualizations. When Evan first saw this, he immediately pointed out how the choice of visual metaphor, the giants, could be improved to better depict the variables involved. So here's my second experiment in which I heeded Evan's point. In this example, the size of the dragon roughly equates to the cost of our Sage journal package relative to the pile of gold, which roughly equates to the number of citable documents provided by the package in publications over the past three years. We might think of these documents as treasure for our students to discover as they adventure through their university careers. The point here is not to present the value of the SAGE package, but to show the value of a better deal. So I turn the page to say, here you can see our Elsevier journal package relative to the SAGE package based on the same variables of cost and citable document supply. The reason I'm focusing on the value provided by these packages is because we've been developing a new concept for collection review. We're trying to flip the script a little bit. Instead of focusing on cancellations, we're focused on justifying our budget needs in a new kind of report we call the budget proposal. We will be presenting on the BP at NASIG in June. Anyway, on the screen, you can see a one variable novelty visualization. If we imagine journals in the top 50th percentile as living humans and journals in the bottom 50th percentile as zombies, we can illustrate the composition of a journal package. This novelty visualization is roughly accurate for Taylor and Francis. Actually, I started by asking for a group image, but Dali couldn't get the numbers right. So then I did one portrait at a time, which I copied into Excel and resized. Honestly, though, the zombie metaphor might be better for a different context. Here, the zombies represent the proportion of journals providing 20 or less subscription platform downloads over three years in our Springer package. The proportion of zombies equates to the proportion of low-use journals. This kind of novelty visualization might be best used to explain why we'd cancel a journal, uh, a journal package. 
Evan will talk about the categories of novelty visualizations we've considered so far and some of the issues involved when choosing visual metaphors. There are all kinds of metaphors to try. Evan has suggested prize pigs at a county fair, size of pig versus size of ribbon or number of ribbons. We're in Minnesota, so our metaphors might tend in a Minnesotan direction. How about the number of morel mushrooms on a patch of ground or a fish on a fishing pole where the size of the fish and the length of the pole mean something to our audience? Or we could depict a pie chart as an actual pie or a pie chart as a cake. The possibilities seem pretty endless to me, but first it's important to have a sense of when and how these viz might be used most effectively. So now Evan will dive into the issues a little more deeply. Well, thank you, Nat. Um, so Nat and I have collaborated over the years on developing reports and tools for collection analysis and data visualization, and as you can tell, particularly as it relates to our journal collections. Um, as we develop various rules in this work, my focus has often been on how to share this information so it is useful to our librarian colleagues, our dean, our faculty colleagues across campus, and other administrators, even accreditors. And we've used various methods to communicate and share information from sophisticated reports using Excel spreadsheets um, to unique visualizations in Tableau uh, to glossy one sheeters for colleagues uh, to bring to department meetings to interactive dashboards using Power BI. Each of these reports and tools and visualizations have strengths and weaknesses. And while they have served us well, none are perfect. In any case, we are trying to make we need to adjust our message considering the context, the purpose, and the audience. Our audience can vary significantly, and therefore their knowledge, understanding, and interest can be equally varied. To communicate about collection analysis means we need to think about various learning preferences and levels of knowledge about our collection and the data we uh, share about them. For some, um, might this well-intentioned chart come off like this? In my role in communication, I'm excited about novelty visualization's potential. Can they help bridge the gap where other reports, charts, or graphs have failed to connect, or provide an alternative that really brings home the points we're trying to convey? In the past, these types of visualizations would have required hiring graphic designers or artists and would need concepts well conceived in advance. This certainly wouldn't be feasible for a quick invitation to an academic department meeting. In fact, even utilizing a uh, clip art library or other repositories of symbols takes more time than utilizing AI. We might now be able to produce an image 10 minutes before we head out the door and have a successful visit to an academic department like in this AI created image. So what role might these images serve in enhancing our presentation um, of collection analysis data? Here's some general ideas of how they might improve our message. One, I think novelty visualizations could help us grab the attention of our audience or change the tone of a presentation. Anytime we are presenting to a group, we are going to have people with different comfort levels and interest in working with data. Can this help us reach that person who hears Charlie Brown's teacher voice when I'm talking about journal usage numbers? Secondly, novelty visualizations might also help us deepen our audience's understanding or really help to bring home a point. I think initially I was thinking of AI created visualizations as potential replacements for traditional charts and graphs. I'm now thinking uh, one of the ways they would be most effective is as a supplement to the traditional tools and viz. Can we create that sort of aha moment or where somebody says, oh, okay, okay, I get your point. A third uh, would be um, another potential benefit would be using novelty visualizations um, to create a lasting impression. Imagine a series of charts and tables in a presentation. So how does one chart midway through going to stick in anyone's brain? It seems to me novelty visualizations can help cement a concept we're trying to get across. Even better, they can give us reference points. Rather than asking if they remember some chart about a journal package, we could say, do you remember when we were talking about those zombie titles in the journal package? Whether we are talking about piles of gold or pigs at the county fair, novelty visualizations could give us a shorthand for concepts that might allow for lasting impressions and reference points in future discussions. Lastly, in many cases, um, our purpose will be just to simply let data speak for itself. That said, we often need to be persuasive. Novelty visualizations can add to our narrative and potentially be more convincing. If we can make the expensive journal package seem less uh, like an expensive budget line 
and more as an asset that provides the biggest pile of riches, we might be able to shape impressions and improve our ability to justify our collections budget. I think novelty visualizations could be especially helpful when we're trying to encourage a change in thinking. Might they also help soften the blow of a cancellation? Is a package full of zombie journals easier for faculty to let go of? Well, part of the interest in doing this work was to capture some of the complexity of previously created visualization. Some of our most simple charts seemed easy candidates for illustrations. For instance, if you think back to the example of humans and zombies, we can take a simple bar chart that represents journal usage in our Springer journal package. This example is the most simple or sort of a first level of a novelty visualization. As a step more complex is the idea of sequential comparison. In this case, we might use multiple images in, in uh, order of magnitude to demonstrate proportion. Imagine looking, looking at which journal packages provide high quality journals for a given discipline. In this example, we are looking at, top, at a top, the top quartile of counting journals according to Saimago. The numbers represent each journal package's count of journals in the top quartile. The successive images show the increasing proportion each package provides. You can see here, we tried a multi-level approach, grouping the packages with a first tier of packages and then a second. And then this last shot slide shows Wiley with the highest number of quality journals and is accentuated with a new image. The successive, the successive increased size of the images emphasize just how important this package is uh, for the quality of our accounting journals. This is still a pretty simple example, but successive images can help us more easily show proportions and unveiling these images can add a bit of drama, which could aid in creating a memorable impression. Now in the past, we've used tree maps as a way of showing the value of individual elements within a whole. You can see uh, an example of a Tableau tree map representing journals uh, within a package. Could we consider extending the sequential comparison idea to allow for something resembling the tree map. This concept could also allow us to include additional information, as this example highlights images to represent a second variable. We could even change the image of an individual package we wanted to emphasize within the tree map. The hope is this would demonstrate both a more complex concept and cause specific elements to stand out and become more memorable. This tree map example gets us closer to that larger goal, which is to create two, vis two variable illustrations in which the size of the objects are truly proportional uh, to the data we're trying to convey. The two giants are a great example of this. The size of the giant is the cost of the package, but the size of the club is usage. The accurate proportions and legibility of the stick figures are the goal. Now, can we use AI to generate the giants to meet that goal? Right now, it doesn't seem that the AI tools that we have used uh, for image generation handle numbers well enough, um, but we hope and expect them to improve. Um, as we've negotiated this challenge of not easily being able to generate proportional images, I think we do see a middle ground. For images to be effective representations of data, there need to be contrasts in size. And we can generate images where the contrast might not directly connect to the data we have, but the images can show a symbolic contrast. One example of visualizations we've created in the past are comparisons of one element against the average. Here's an example that demonstrates our ASME package has a high cost per use. The top factory shows an average cost per use, and the bottom shows ASME. The steam or smoke coming from the smokestacks isn't exactly proportional to our cost per use, but this image is a symbol uh, this image is a symbol that is a middle ground between the very simple images and our attempts with the giants. In the end, we can think of these examples as data symbols. They're not measurable representations of the data, but show an adequate contrast to demonstrate the range within the data. The use of steam or smoke helps us communicate that a greater cost for use number has a negative connotation and hopefully would create a lasting impression and future reference point for discussing cost per use with colleagues across campus. In this example, the choice of image is a key component to creating the impression. We have tended to refer to these choices of images as metaphors. In this scenario, part of the metaphor selection relates to whether the concept connotes uh, a negative or positive impression. So zombies and pollution give us a negative connotation, whereas a pile of riches uh, or a county fair ribbon might create a positive one. 
Another approach for selecting image metaphors is to consider disciplines of our audience or collections we're analyzing. We often present to liaison librarians, academic departments, or even creating materials used with accreditation and program review meetings. Our choice of image can connect the presentation to the discipline and hopefully our audience. That said, this doesn't come without risk. If we choose imagery that plays on stereotypes or shows a lack of awareness of the department's specific curriculum, it could hurt our credibility rather than help it. And here's an example of using beakers to represent article downloads in chemistry. The beaker is particularly useful in that it can handle two variable concepts because both size of beaker and how full it is can represent multiple concepts. Um, but you will also notice these aren't the fancy AI gener generated novelty visualizations we've been discussing. In fact, these resemble sort of basic clip art commonly used in infographics. And for some of our concepts, really, these are pretty effective. To contrast, what might this look like with AI image generation? So this is pretty cool, but in most cases, simpler may often be better. I think this example of chemistry beakers suggests that in many cases, less is more. If an image is too busy or complicated, it loses its effect. If we are trying to clarify or emphasize a concept, we want to reduce noise. A busy AI-generated image might actually add noise and muddle our point. Another challenge of this complexity is how much context is needed for the audience to understand the point. The more we need to explain or add words to the image, the more I would question how effective this method is for communicating about our collections. It certainly wouldn't make sense to replace a complex chart with an equally complex image. As of right now, Dolly 3 doesn't handle data well. This adds challenges to creating images that demonstrate proportionality. We need to be able to show contrasts to make points. If we exaggerate those concepts, are we moving away from the images representing real data? Lastly, while we might reach some of our audience by adding novelty visualization, there is a risk that some might see the images as less serious. In using these, there's a fine line to walk to maintain credibility. We also might not consider connotations others might place on the images we choose. AI can create images that further stereotypes and can be downright offensive. We, might, we must be vigilant that we are not causing harm by our choice of images. So where do we go from here? Our focus has been on journal collections data because that's at the core of uh, our work, but we could see this type of communication being useful with other types of library data. We might also consider deeper data storytelling in which we create broader narratives that use a uh, succession of images to create richer stories. We have tried playing around with AI videos. There are some concepts that are better expressed with motion. So think trend data or longitudinal data. One area I think we will pursue is to use images to promote collections and advertise new acquisitions uh, or subscriptions. Whether or not novelty visualizations become a mainstay of our communication about collection analysis, experimenting with AI image generation has given me a new view on the power of using images to create impressions and will shape my thinking as we continue to try to effectively demonstrate the value our collections provide the university. Mm -hmm. section. Yeah. Do you have them? No. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, if you, uh, our previous research is, is more of the conventional sort of how to collect data, how to manipulate data, how to turn it into effective data visualizations. If you're interested in any of that, it's uh, at the link on the screen, libguides.mnsu.edu forward slash collection dash analysis uh, forward slash research. Um, we want to thank you. Yeah. And do you have any other comments? No, no, thank yeah. you. And uh, let us know if you have any questions or anything. Okay. Well, thank you both for that. That was really cool. <laughs> like, what a what an interesting reimagining of data visualization. So, thank you so much. I've I've never really seen anything like that, and it, I I think a lot of people's minds are blown. <laughs> so, thank you for sharing that. There are a few questions. We hopefully have time for one or two of them. Uh, the first question is, uh, how have you dealt with IP issues inherent in generating images with many AI systems? You know, that's an interesting problem. Uh, our, we were just talking about that earlier today. Our state system has a new policy where they require verification of that you have the copyright to use something or 
you've gone through the fair use steps. We really haven't explored that path. Um, we haven't really rolled this out yet. It was more an idea to explore it to this point, but it's definitely something we have to think through. We might not even be able to do this with it yeah, system yeah. pretty soon, depending on how that whole policy rolls out. All right, thank you. Next question. How do you make sure the generated image is accurately representing data? I think you kind of touched upon this, but if you'd like to provide it's, it's, it's difficult. Dolly 3 doesn't get numbers uh, and it doesn't get proportions. So what I've been doing is creating an image that gets, especially for a two variable image, where it gets roughly the, the right things down. So a giant with a staff or a club that's longer than its body or a giant with a staff or club that's that's half the size of its body. Dolly 3 can do that, and then I can resize them. What's the proportions of, you know, for example, those two variables of cost and use, usage are accurate. Then you can resize, resize them so that they are accurate relative to each other. You can do the same thing with clip art too, by the way. It's just all about sort of sizing it to get the right proportions. And I've been doing it so far in Excel where you can just very easily do it. Thank you. The next question, um, how do you measure the quality of journals? For example, your chart about Wiley. Yeah, so um, I think Evan mentioned that yeah. it's from Simago, yeah. where they provide that uh, it's citation-based um, data. They rank them by quartile. They actually rank them overall on their entire list. Ultimately, I think their data is derived from Scopus, but it's really convenient, so we've, we, we use Simago to create sort of universal lists of journals that then are tied to all the other data that we have as a library. So then we can just sort of mix and match it when we need to. Yeah, we've used different variables in the past for quality, but but the Simago is basically the, the easiest for us to work with. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. We have time for probably one more if anyone has. Oh, I. As soon as I said that, okay, we have we have the one more then. Um, when providing such visualizations and you have your fish on the hook, do you offer a link to the raw or traditionally visualized report for those seeking more detailed information? I often want to check which metrics are being used. So I think we imagine this as a supplement, not as a replacement for other data visualizations or providing the data. And yes, when you walk into different departments, they all have different expectations. We prepare data visualizations for accounting, and they come back to us and say, give us the spreadsheets. Yes. We don't want to see these. Uh, so it, I think it, it, you have to use everything together. This would be a supplement simply to change the mood of a meeting, to create a lasting yeah. impression. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm speaking for Evan. No, Evan's, no, no. Evan's led all of our discussions. No, 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 but I think that's exactly it. I think that's exactly is that I think originally we thought of it as a, as a, as a swap. It's like, oh, well, we can take out this old traditional biz and we can add something new in. And I think what we've come to is, is that actually really where, at least at this point, it's going to be effective is as something that supplements the kind of data we're sharing. And I think it gets to that point of whatever your audience is, I mean, we're so often presenting with people with such different sort of backgrounds to uh, or knowledge of the information we're providing. And so to me, it's almost just providing an alternative way of us presenting that that might connect with that one or two people who are not enjoying the uh, other ways that we have chosen to present our data over the years. So. And part of it is that when we try to communicate, communicate something as simple as cost of usage, some people will say, what? What are you talking about? Yeah. So this is when yeah. we say, well, how about zombies? So yes, yeah. You know what I mean? All right. Well, I think that's it as far as questions go. So I just want to thank you both again one more time. That was a really fascinating presentation. So we appreciate you being here. Oh, sure. Thank you so much. You're welcome.